You're not going to go to the beach here. You're not going to see museums or monuments. You're not going to go for tapas or to award-winning restaurants. You're not going to experience traditions. You're not going to relax or rest. You are going to do everything here intensely. Hello everybody, I'm John Strickland of JLS Consulting. Welcome to the first of our aviation sessions of this year's World Travel Market Virtual. I hope you're going to stay with us for the next hour. It should be a really interesting discussion because our first guest today is the CEO of a, a little known airline. Um, many of you will have not have heard of this airline. They only flew about 150 million passengers last year. They've only got about 450 planes and they only made about a billion euros in profit. Now, because the story's changed for them and all airlines recently. And the airline I'm talking about with my rather feeble attempt at humour is, of course, Ryanair. So the credentials themselves tell you the story of just what a, a sizable uh, and uh, important airline this is, uh, not only in Europe, but as a global player. And the CEO of that airline is our guest today. So I'd like to say a warm welcome to Michael O'Leary. Michael, welcome to World Travel Market Virtual. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. Very pleased to be uh, at least communicating if it's, if it's only via Zoom rather than in person. Uh, certainly would have been uh, better if we could have done that. Now, Michael, um, I, I gave us sort of a backdrop there and the statistics for last year. And uh, the story of Ryanair is amazing, of course, because you started off in the 1980s as a very small airline founded by Irish businessman Tony Ryan. And I believe, you know, one of your first jobs you used to work for Tony Ryan was to suggest to actually close the airline down. And I suppose at that point, you never imagined you'd be sitting here today with an airline of the scale that I just described. Oh, that's true. I mean, in the late 80s, uh, Ryan was trying to be, you know, uh, it was a forerunner of kind of uh, trying to be a sort of a, low, a, a lower cost all service airline in, in a marketplace where the all service airlines didn't make any money. So being a lower, a lower priced all service airline was a recipe for disaster. Uh, I strongly encouraged Tony to close the place down. It would never, ever make money. Um, and to be fair to him, he was the one who said, look, there's this uh, interesting operation in the States called Southwest, taking advantage of deregulation in the US market. At that stage, deregulation, you know, and it's often forgotten, was one of Jimmy Carter's few policy successes, uh, but it was absolutely transformative in uh, the US. And all you needed to be was uh, in the US at that time, in the mid, late 80s, seeing what Southwest was doing, coming from uh, Europe, which at the time was still the legacy airlines and uh, monopoly protectionism, Chicago Convention, bilateral agreements, civil servants and rich business people flying around, you know, uh, paying ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, particularly the case of an island like Ireland, where then the only way on and off the island that stage was by boat. This was clearly the future and Europe would eventually follow deregulation. So in many respects, uh, it was a combination of being lucky in our timing and also uh, Tony Ryan's sort of, um, you know, bravery and fortitude in not following my advice and closing it down. That's quite remarkable. And yeah, you went over, I think, to uh, the US and you met the, the legendary Herb Keller, who was a fan yeah. of the Southwest. And isn't it that story that you more or less wrote down a few things on the back of the serviette or something and came back and then uh, put it into action? <laughs> Yeah, I, I never, every idiot has this, you know, it always seems to start writing rubbish on the back of the survey and all of which completely untrue. I mean, I remember, you know, absolutely uh, going to Love Field, seeing a 25 minute turnaround, which at that stage was almost like a Formula One kind of mm -hmm. pit stop at a time when, you know, I was new to the industry here in Ireland, you know, we had lots of ex air Lincoln people telling us, oh, a turnaround can't be done me, you know, it has to take an hour and 15 minutes. The pilot has to have a uh, cigarette and a shag before the next flight can move. The camera crew have to whinge to their union about the quality of the catering before any, you know. So nothing happened quickly because it was all European state carriers. You saw what was going on in the southwest in Love Field and it was revelatory. I mean, that was the, you didn't need to be a genius. I didn't need to write anything down on, the, on, on a napkin. I did have a legendary dinner with um, Herb Kelleher uh, that evening, Colleen Barrett. I don't remember any of the dinner because he drank me under the table. Uh, can't remember anything except I was violently sick and hung over for about four days afterwards. But, you know, all you needed to see was what Southwest were doing at airports at that time. Bring it back, replicate it, you know, go to a single fleet, 
25 minute turnaround, use secondary airports at the time if necessary. You know, and in a Europe which at the time was high bound by ridiculously high airfares and bilateral agreements, legacy airlines, which were hopeless, uh, you almost couldn't lose as long as, you know, you were sensible about it. No, it's, uh, certainly uh, you brought it over here very successfully and indeed uh, bolted on some uh, other, you know, Ryanair yeah. airports, uh, approaches as well, I guess. Uh, sure. Just a reminder for the audience, um, uh, there may be a chance for one or two questions for, for Michael. I've got a big list of my own, which was hopefully going to keep you interested, but we, you can put those through on the, the chat function. Michael, I want to ask you more, of course, as we go along about the uh, Ryanair sure. business model and future development, but let's just, just hit the... the the inevitable topic of a moment if we can you know this covid pandemic you know it's just knocked the industry over as indeed it's yeah. knocked humanity over did we really underestimate this when it hit in the spring i was talking to one airline recently they said well we, we do our scenario planning we'd even done a scenario for you know a virus a pandemic but we never imagined we'd be in a situation where we'd be grounded with zero revenue for an extended period of time what, what's your own feeling now several months into this crisis I mean, you know, look, it's easy to be wise in hindsight. None of us have been experienced a global pandemic. The last one was 1918 after the First World War. Yeah. Um, no, we had no scenario for this. You know, I mean, look at us. Uh, and, you know, we think we're pretty good at running an airline. But, uh, you know, we were 90% hedged on fuel out for the rolling 12 months to March of 2021. We thought at worst, you know, you might have a nice landing volcano or something that might... Uh, reduce your capacity by five or ten percent for a, a couple of weeks so that even after 9 11 you know we were grounded for four days after 9 11 got back in the air pretty quickly so nothing prepared us for this um except i think in the case of ryanair our, our innate conservatism like we've always run the business with very strong cash balances we've always run the business with very strong balance sheet i am uh, you know i hate debt uh, so we own almost all of our own fleet so no, we didn't expect it. Uh, nobody did. Uh, if they did, you'd been in. You know, you'd have been investing in. Uh, you'd have put your money into Amazon and Zoom and not into the airlines. Um, but they again, if they, what, they, what it teaches us is that the airlines that adopt quickly, adapt quickly, flex the business as quickly as they can, will emerge out of this much stronger uh, and much more able to offer people or consumers and you know, the really low fares that they will want and need uh, to uh, spring the recovery. And I've heard lots of rubbish coming out of, you know, mainly the, again, the legacy airlines. Oh, it'll be 20, it'll be 2050 before the world recovers from this. It'll be 2035 before volumes go back to where they were in 20. Rubbish. Volumes will go back in 2021 and 2022 pretty quickly. They'll go back because the airlines led by Ryanair will discount prices. The hotels will discount prices into the summer of 2021, the winter of 21 into summer 22. We will all discount to try to recover the business we've lost. So I think the volume recovery will be quite strong, particularly in those markets. You know, and I would urge those markets where governments uh, are sensible and reduce airport uh, taxes and fees in the short term. It will take a longer period of time, three or four years, for pricing to recover to 2019 levels. Uh, but I think the volume recovery would be strong and would be surprising. Uh, but yeah, it would go to those governments that are uh, sensible and you know roll out the incentives. We're pushing hard with the UK government, for example, to uh, waive APD, which is you know the most uh, uh, egregious tax, regressive and egregious tax on uh, travel. But well, I think well, if, well, uh, if, if she soon had to wait that for a year or two, it would sp yeah. stimulate a much more aggressive recovery in the UK. Yeah, I want to ask you a bit more about governments in a moment, but just uh, interested in what you touched on there, your own business model, you, you, your own uh, testing of, of debt. Yeah, it seems to me you know, the, the core of Ryanair's success over the years has been this focus on costs. You know, you know anybody can offer low fares, but anybody can go into business in the process. You've made a, yeah. a virtue of that. Does that come from your own accounting background? Because, I mean, to me, I used to look at what you did, you know, the last year I worked in, and uh, I remember as a network planner, we would look at... Uh, you know, revenues and load factors and so on. We just accepted the costs we were given by our finance colleagues. We never thought about challenging them. Certainly, uh, I came to realize that you could indeed challenge them because that's what you did. Is it your accounting background that uh, gave you that sense of need to focus when you, you came into the industry? I'm not sure I would necessarily put it down to my accounting background, but I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that the accountants are by far and away the best people to run airlines. You know, the first 
iteration of airlines from 1930s through to about the year 2000. You know, airlines were always run by pilots who were very skilled at flying airlines, but utterly useless when it comes to efficiency, productivity, or costs. Accountants have no personality, uh, but are generally very good at uh, running cost, high volume, low margin cost businesses. I think you've seen that emerge, you know, over the years that more and more the focus of successful airlines uh, have been run by the accountants. I mean, the, the one notable exception would be Willie Walsh, who was uh, a, a historically a pilot, mm -hmm. uh, although he's the most accountant-like pilot I've ever come across and there's enough cop on to kind of copy what Ryanair are doing. But no, I think most of it goes back to, if anything, my farming background. You know, I grew up on a farm here in Ireland um, and farmers have to be kind of, you know, uh, to survive the winter. Mm -hmm. They don't waste money. Uh, they're very conscious of buying when everybody is selling and uh, selling when everybody is buying. And I think, uh, so I think in many respects, if uh, there's anything that to, uh, I think what drives us as a group in Ryanair is, Yes, there's a focus, accounting focus, but there's much more of a focus in, I think, historically by being, you know, uh, of farming stock uh, and not wasting money so that you can survive through the winter until the spring comes. Oh, so it makes a lot of sense. And Michael, you touched there on governments. I mean, that's your biggest uh, frustration, perhaps uh, outside of, you know, the, the mechanics of a virus itself. You know, government reaction, we've seen complete... Uh, discoordination and on and off quarantines and so on. What's yeah. your view on why the industry is not getting better traction? Because you're out there shouting about this, uh, every industry body, whether it's the ARTA or A4E, ACI on the airport side, you name it. All the bodies are saying similar things, encouraging uh, removal of quarantine, moving towards testing. But uh, have governments seemingly forgotten the economic value of air transport? And is there a way, is there a better way that the industry can actually try to get some engagement with politicians to move us on to steps in recovery? Well, no, you know, it's, I mean, look, it's very difficult, you know, uh, it's easy to be critical of politicians that they do lots of stupid things. Um, uh, did they mishandle the pandemic? Yes, probably. Uh, I think it was inevitable that we had the first lockdown, you know, and the first wave of lockdown in March through to, you know, April, May and June was inevitable. You know, they did it in China. We did it in Europe. I think what was disturbing, though, and worrying was the way that the governments mishandled that first lockdown. You know, the lockdown was never going to be a solution to fixing the virus, but the lockdown should have given governments the time to put in place mass testing. I think what's been really concerning is the incompetence of European governments when it came to putting in place mass testing. You know, Boris Johnson in the UK promised we'd have a world-class track and testing and tracing system. Of course, like every other Boris Johnson promised complete and utter vacuous rubbish. You know, we need a situation that, you know, we should have put in place after the first lockdowns. Every European government should have had the capacity to test 20% of its population on a weekly basis. Do mass testing. That would have been the way out of this thing. Of course, they saw the numbers go down in the way this summer. Everybody down tools. Everybody went off on holidays and nothing was put in place for the winter. So we've now walked ourselves into a second set of lockdowns here in Europe. Again, nothing will happen because they're not fixing mass testing. Um, but hopefully the vaccine will come along in its place. I think the worrying trend for the, our industry generally, though, was the instinctive reaction of most European governments, which was, you know, in this crisis, to bail out loss-making for like, legacy airlines. You know, you see multi-billion state aid dumps into Lufthansa, Air France, KLM. Can I just, uh, can yeah. I just part, part that point, Mark, because sure. I've got it on my list. So I just want to bring it, uh, bring it okay. in. I want to look at some of the airlines as we go along, and that'll give a great chance to... To, for you to talk about that point. Just on the, the testing, uh, again, we have discussion about whether this is after departure, before departure. It seems a consensus, of course, is getting done before departure, and then people can be okay to yeah. travel. Of course, there's many different kinds of tests. I mean, I, I, I don't, as far as I'm aware, you're not a scientist, I'm certainly not. I've read about so many different kinds of testing in recent months, and some are better than others in accuracy. Some are quite quick, some yeah. take a long time. Um, any thoughts on how that could be refined so we can move to something that does the job of giving the confidence so that people are not got the virus and it's manageable and should it also I mean, be done away from an airport environment? I mean, like airport testing is a complete waste of time. A, it's too late, it takes too long. And, you know, what do you do in the middle of an airport terminal when you have a couple of uh, positive tests? Well, uh, you know, they'll empty the airport. It, it, complete rubbish. I mean, I think we're generally supportive of testing, pre-departure testing, 
we would very much support, you know, PCR testing at the moment. It should be widely available, you know, but at a cost of 150 or 180 euros per test, it's prohibitive. Mm -hmm. Government should be providing PCR testing free of charge. It would be a, it would cost them a fraction of the amount of money that actually lockdowns and furlough schemes and everything else are costing them. But it's only going to be effective if you're capable of doing, you know, 10, 20 percent of your population on a weekly basis and that you mandate to take place on a weekly basis. In Ireland, for example, you know, we're still slobbing along testing 100,000 people a week with a population of 5 million. That should be 500 to a million people a week. And then actually you can identify where it is. You isolate those who uh, test positive. And everybody has a recent positive or negative kind of uh, COVID test. And, and, you know, Europe has the capacity to do that. And that's what we should be putting in place this winter, you know, to free us from the risk of a third lockdown in the spring, you know, before the next, well, you know, hopefully before uh, the vaccines get here. Uh, but I see no evidence of, it. you know, governments, you look in Ireland, for example, here, you know, we, it's being run by doctors. They're very happy to lock everybody down because one, they're not locked down. Two, they don't use their job. They've had no pay cuts. So like they're completely untouched by it. Whereas they would just lock down mass areas of the uh, of the economic of the the economy um, without any thought for the longer term consequences, medical consequences, uh, mental health consequences, or economic consequences of these kind of lockdowns. Um, so I think you know that's where I would be critical of politicians. I think it's very difficult to be critical of in the first response. Neither we nor they have ever dealt with a pandemic before. Uh, the leadership uh, has been pretty poor. Trump was abysmal. The European Commission was pretty poor as well. Like, you know, you've seen European governments introducing national restrictions. So much a national approach, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, in an economic uh, system where, you know, there's allegedly free movement of people across the Schengen zone or across the European Union. And yet, you know, we were dealing with different changing restrictions on a daily basis, all being introduced on a national basis. Um, so, yes, there's lots to learn from that, but I think the critical thing we need to learn now is we need testing. Uh, the testing should be not at airports. It should be within, whether it's 72 hours or 36 hours, I don't really care. But people should be coming to airports with a negative test, you know, the form on their phone or something else. And then actually, certainly in short haul or within Europe, we can go back flying with reasonable confidence and with reasonable security. Longer haul will be a bit of a longer recovery, but certainly shorter haul, a short haul at inter-European travel should be restarting quickly. Well, we saw some of that, didn't we? I mean, we had what a, a sort of uh, brief summer, what, July, August, when you got going a bit more before all the quarantines intervened. So I think the evidence yeah. is that that will happen. Just briefly on the vaccine, Michael, I mean, we got that news yesterday, seemingly positive news from uh, Pfizer that they've got this. Uh, apparently very effective vaccine. Seems to have been a bit of euphoria there. The stock market, your stock others certainly took a hike. Seems a bit premature, doesn't it? Uh... I don't think so. You know, I mean, like the stock market tends to anticipate, it looks forward anyway. You know, I, the development from Pfizer yesterday, while well, welcome, it's only one of three or four vaccines that will be licensed this side of Christmas. And if you talk to the ECDC, you talk to the US, the FDA, you know, there are multiple vaccines that are in final phase three testing, you know, so there's going to be a wave of vaccines coming at us. Certainly, I think licensed this side of Christmas, I would say widely available to the high risk groups by the end of Q1. And I think, you know, there's reasonable optimism now that summer 2021, we'll get back to some degree of normality. We may not get back all the way to 2019, but in short haul, I see no reason why we won't go back to 75, 80 percent of 2019. Uh, the only restriction on us would be, you know, the ability to hire and train pilots and cabin crew and have them current. Uh, and I think we'll do that probably better than any other airline. Now, the challenge for airlines, of course, is uh, you, you were down to zero operations for a, a few months uh, and you said you will fly at most. 40% this, this winter, given the situation mm -hmm. we're in. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's the devil's own job, isn't it, now day-to-day -day for airlines in terms of planning. We hear complaints about uh, air, airlines cancelling flights and so on at, at the last minute, but you know, all the normal parameters that you would use, uh, the historical booking data and so on, and trends, you know, pretty well out of the window at the moment, aren't they? I mean, you're seeing bookings coming very much in, the last minute in a very unpredictable way. You know, this, this, uh, yeah, that's true, John. I mean, this winter's a write-off. You know, our booking profile, which would normally run sort of reasonably over a 12 to 15-week period, is now down to basically four or five weeks. 
Mm-hmm. You know, many people are flying now. People have to fly within the next week, two weeks. They're pretty certain, you know, for uh, business reasons, essential travel, fa- family emergencies, whatever. But that's about it. You know, but no, November is always a bad time of the year anyway. I mean, the, the real issue for us as an industry is can we rescue some level of coverage for Christmas? And after that, it will be, you know, nothing I think will happen until we get to probably Easter. Um, but, you know, we do need to look forward. Um, I think vaccines are coming. Uh, clearly, the question mark is whether they'll be here in time in wide scale uh, for summer 21. I'm reasonably optimistic I think they will. Lots of the vaccine manufacturers have been pre-manufacturing these vaccines even before they were licensed. Lots of the European government has already uh, bought I think, 300 million doses of the uh, Pfizer vaccine. The, uh, uh, the UK government announced yesterday they had 40 million doses purchased, 10 million for delivery pre-Christmas. So I think there's a real uh, sense of optimism that we would get the high-risk groups over 70s, healthcare workers, nursing homes, you know, the essential services would be covered off in advance of summer 21. And then it's a question of how quick can the airlines recover and get capacity back in the air? Yeah, and you said about the opportunity and hopefully some recovery uh, next summer. You've talked in your, in your, your half-year results last week about those opportunities. And again, just coming yeah. back to where we began, you've got cash in the business. You've raised cash as well for a share issue and, and, and a bond also. I mean, that, that, that's uh, critical. I mean, you can, you know, Ryanair's not about to suddenly disappear, is it? You've got enough funding to go for, what, a year and a half, a couple of years. There's not many airlines that are in that position. That's true. I mean, I think, you know, I hope we've uh, done sensible things during the crisis. You know, lots of our competitors are out doing, you know, desperate sale and lease packs of aircraft, you know, which is fine. You know, it raises money in the short term, but it really gives you a very high operating cost base for the next five or 10 years. We, despite the fact that we have 80% of our fleet unencumbered, we have resisted that temptation because, you know, frankly, I go back to my farming experience. We don't want to sell at distressed prices, and I certainly don't want to borrow money at inflated rates. So we took the view that the sensible thing to do was have an equity issue. We raised 400 million from our existing shareholders. I led that, I had to write a check for 16 million for my 4% of that issue. We then went to the bond market. We raised a bond for 850 million. Um, Again, we did that at uh, about 2.8%, which uh, is much lower cost financing than than our competitors are doing uh, sale and lease packs at the moment. And we have about 1.5 billion in debt to repay next year, which is the UK government loan and our the original 2014 bond is due for repayment. So we've taken all that financing risk off the table. But I'm much more excited, you know, about the opportunities that there are out there at the moment. Like we are very active at SLOS conference uh, recently. We are in, in intensive negotiations with quite a number of airports who are beginning to realize actually that, you know, Lufthansa's fleet is not going to come back, uh, that they're going to be left with a lot of uh, shortages next summer, that the only way they can return to growth will be working with somebody, uh, an airline that's flexible and can rapidly deploy aircraft and crews like Ryanair. I think what was different between Ryanair and most of our competitors in Europe during the crisis is we kept flying our aircraft. You're seeing Lufthansa park up loads of aircraft for the last nine months, BA, I don't say, I mean, first long haul aircraft, it's a sensible thing to do. Uh But a lot of those aircraft will need a heavy maintenance check before they can go back in the air. What we've done frantically and, you know, to our cost, is we've been putting around keeping all the aircraft flying, keeping all our pilots and cabin crew, all of our pilots have flown at least once a month. So we're keeping the pilots current, we're keeping the cabin crew current, we're keeping the aircraft current, so that really we can pounce on uh, growth. Uh, And it's important that we fulfill, because I think there's going to be an enormous snapback in travel demand, because one of the things we certainly learned, and I get on a daily basis when I go home, Mrs. O'Leary uh, is very keen to go back to the Algarve, and I suspect she'll be there uh, about 2.5 nanoseconds after the restrictions, <laughs> coronavirus restrictions are lifted. You know, she hasn't had a holiday now for over 12 months, and she thinks herself and the children uh, uh, need a holiday, and, you know, frankly, I think she is reflective of the overwhelming majority of Europe's population, uh, and they will go back. And I think what's interesting, Bernie, from a WTI point of view, I think they'll be reluctant to go back to long haul for summer 2021. But I think there is going to be an invasion of the beaches of Spain and the Algarve and the Canaries and the Balearics and Greece and, you know, they, Italy. You know, they're really going to see a surge of that intra-European tourism next year, and we need to be there providing the capacity at low yeah. prices, keeping fares down. As you say, Mark, I mean, you've got a cost base. 
you've got a low cost base, you've got cash in the bank, you've raised more, you've got this enormous fleet of 737-800s that I alluded to, indeed some, some Airbuses through, through Lauda too, and yeah. the order underway for the Maxis. Now, uh, you're nothing if not opportunistic. It seems to me you never let a good crisis go to waste. These aircraft themselves are pivotal in your performance. I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, it might, my distant memory, one of your quotes from the Michael O'Leary book of quotes was, I think it might have been when you got the second batch of 800s and you said something like if you asked me if I got a good deal from Boeing it was after 9-11 I would say it was okay if you asked Boeing they would say it was rapacious I think it was you said something like that and you know you've got these very low cost and very efficient aircraft uh, you have the MAX expected to come into service I guess you know, what I'm saying this is still pivotal to your success the scale of, uh, of the fleet the efficiency and the cost on which you acquired these aircraft. I think so. You know, I mean, you know, I, uh, in many respects, well, you know, uh, we are poised, I think, for a period of very dynamic growth in Ryanair. One of the things we really worked very hard on during the downturn was working with our partners in Boeing to get the MAX aircraft back into service. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks now like it, the, the MAX 800 that was grounded uh, will be back in, probably licensed by the FAA, back to return to service at the end of November. We think the EASA here will license it in early January, early mid-January, the 800 will go back into service. Uh, that uh, releases, if you like, the backlog of parked aircraft in, uh, in uh, Seattle, Renton, and those places. Boeing then, I think, will be moving straight on with the FAA and EASA to license our aircraft, which is the MAX 200, the game changer, which you know we have, uh, we're the lead up or lead customer for. It's an incredible aircraft. It has 4% more seats, but burns 16% less fuel and reduces our emissions by 40%. Um, so it's an incredible aircraft. Uh, we Have are very excited. Yet? Have you been on a MAX, Michael? Uh, no, I've never been on a MAX. Uh, but the pilots are, pilots have been on it. We have uh, three MAX simulators already in place, one in Dublin, one in Gatwick, uh, one, so I think one in Bergamo. Pilots love it. You know, the performance of the aircraft is incredible. It is a great aircraft. It has you know, suffered reputational damage as a result of the software issues, but they've been addressed. Uh, I think this is when it, it returns to service at the end of November, John, it will be the most audited, the most interrogated, the safest aircraft uh, ever to uh, fly. Uh, and we couldn't be more excited. I mean, we're now poised, I think, you know, over the next five years, we're due to take 135 firm uh, deliveries. Here, the deliveries have been delayed, but we're reworking that delivery schedule with Boeing uh, and I'm very optimistic now that we will take delivery of about 30 of those aircraft in advance of summer 2021, another 60 of those aircraft in advance of summer 2022. So really, we would be the one airline across Europe with large deliveries coming, able to work with airport partners and with our tourism partners across Europe to say, look, we can restore this business quickly. We have the aircraft. We have There's a huge surplus of pilots and cabin crew out there. We can get your tourism industry back again. We can get the hotels full again. We get the beaches full again. Uh, we are poised, I think, at you know the dawn of an extraordinary era of growth, and hopefully at low well, fares and modest profits for Ryanair. Just two more things on the Max, Michael. I mean, I want to link that into growth and, yeah. and competition. I mean, uh, you are confident that uh, there will be customer confidence and, uh, and user confidence on the aircraft. I, I, I went to, to visit Boeing in Seattle almost a year ago in December. They, they invited a number of people, different uh, disciplines of the industry, to talk about exactly how that aircraft was going to go back into service. And they were very mindful then about the need to get confidence, not only of customers, traveling customers, but pilots, as you said, cabin crew have got to work on that plane because from them, hopefully having confidence, then the traveling public could be confident too. You've said before that customers wouldn't necessarily know they're on a max, but of course this was a, a heck of a, a hit with those two uh, tragic crashes. Do you think sure. that confidence can be built? Are you envisaging any particular things you were doing, Ryanair, to, to give assurance if people, because the media, of course, will look at any even minor incident, you know, a, a baggage truck bumps into a plane, if it's a max, it'll be in the headlines. I mean, look, I think, it will certainly be subject to that scrutiny over the next 12 or 24 months. I welcome that scrutiny. I think it's good. Everybody, the operators, Boeing, everybody will be, you know, incredibly sensitive. Uh, but I draw huge confidence from, you know, we have very experienced senior pilots who've been working closely. They've been in the same in Seattle. They've been in our simulators here. You talk to the professionals who fly the aircraft, they rave about it. You know, I don't know how to fly a plane. You know, I don't care. 
But all of the uh, aviation versus ours, the other Europeans, yes, they're very complimentary about what, that, you know, learning from the screw-ups and the mistakes that Boeing made in delivering the aircraft without kind of highlighting the, uh, the software issues of the MCAS system. I think they've learned from that failure, and now it must be the most well-known system in any aircraft anywhere in the world. Um, but the pilot, man, and remember, also this is an aircraft that was flying for over 12 months in North America. Like it has a lot of flights already accomplished. Mm -hmm. There was clearly a design flaw and a software issue that wasn't, I think, you know, properly trained for. But now everybody that goes through the simulator, goes through the procedure, is aware of the MCAS, switch it off, turn it on. Um, you know, I would be very confident going forward that this is a great aircraft. My experience with customers, and I say this as a, you know, as a consumer uh, of airlines, we like flying on new aircraft. They're new and they're shiny and the interiors are cool. And, you know, we don't care that much about the technology. Um, and I think our customers will respond in the same way to the max. Uh, the interiors are fantastic. There's, there's longer, uh, there's wider, say, or there's longer seat pitch. Uh, there's more seats, but there's more leg room. Um, and I have little doubt, you know, and certainly at the price we're buying these aircraft, it will able, enable us to pass on lower fares to our customers for the next five or 10 years, widen the pricing gap between Ryanair and every other airline in Europe. And could you and see you yourself coming back? In this industry, pricing wins. Exactly. And can you see yourself coming back? Uh, for, I mean, you, you've put big orders in in the past, which many people would have uh, seen uh, as incredulous, but of course they've been well justified. Could you see yourself coming back for maybe more of the, the planned larger version of a Max 10? I, I think Max 10 would be a little longer because, you know, again, Max 10 has slightly been delayed because one of the issues with Boeing and the FAA and the ASA, you know, they've committed to more design changes on the Max 10. So I think the first Max 10 has been delayed or put back by two years or something. But okay. yeah, certainly we're already in, you know, negotiations with Boeing, uh, both for more of the Max 200s and also on the Max 10s. But I think a, a, a deal on Max 10s will take a little bit longer. I think Boeing's kind of, uh, correctly, Boeing's uh, priorities at the moment are get the, 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 the Max back in the air, uh, get the 200 certified and delivered, you know, uh, eliminate the backlog of deliveries and it will take them 12 or 18 months to get rid of that and then really focus on delivering our design, uh, change the design of the, of the MAX 10s and delivering another great aircraft. And 737 is the greatest aircraft ever built. It is the backbone of most airline fleets across the world. Um, and, you know, we're very proud to be one of Boeing's uh, leading partners across the world. Could you see yourself ever going for Airbus? I mean, you inherited Airbus through the acquisition of Louder, and uh, you've indicated in recent investor reports, you know, at least you'll evaluate the Airbus side of the tracks. I suppose it's really interesting Airbus, to keep it open. You know, I mean, I talk regularly to Airbus, and Guillaume Fourier and his team, they're doing a good job, but clearly in very difficult circumstances. I mean, I think the challenge for Airbus in doing a deal with us is um, twofold. One, the NEO before COVID was a very successful program anyway, so they have a much longer tailback orders uh, at higher prices uh, than Boeing have. Uh, so in many respects, you know, we are, uh, we are, we're a victim of our success, the success of our partnership with Boeing is that we frankly have lower prices on Boeing than Airbus can offer on the Airbus aircraft for understandable reasons. Their NEOs were a more successful program over recent years. The question in my, in my mind, you know, and I've had a couple of discussions with uh, Jean Fauré on this is, you know, do Boeing, uh, does Airbus have some opportunities there? You've, they've suffered a lot of cancellations. They've, you know, the, the manufacturing rate has collapsed. We'd like to be able to replace, I mean, Lauda has a fleet of uh, secondhand leased uh, A320s. Uh -huh. We would very much like to replace that with a fleet of, a fleet of uh, A320s or A321neos, but only if the pricing can match what we have on Boeing. And if it doesn't match what we have on Boeing, then, you know, regrettably, I think we'll finish up getting rid of the Airbuses out of Lauda altogether and ultimately it will become a Boeing operator. But I still hope that I'm still optimistic that we can reach a deal with um, Airbus on price. The challenge though is, and it's one for Airbus, is, you know, they got to be able to match Boeing's pricing. Otherwise, you know, we're a one-trick pony. We will go with whichever aircraft offers us the lowest per seat cost. Absolutely. Now you've got, we've talked about the aircraft, we've talked about your belief in opportunities. Uh, let's come back to the competitive landscape in the coming years. 
Um, yeah. Just go, I'd like to go through a few of the groups. We've got the three uh, network groups. I wouldn't say the legacy because I know, although Woody's gone, he would deny that uh, IAG is a legacy, a different approach. Look, yeah. let's look at those three. Um, IAG, you've got admiration for. You've even put in a organizational structure, a Rhino group structure now, which you say emulates uh, what IAG did under Willy. Then we have Air France, KLM, and Lufthansa, all three. Uh, have different approaches. It seems to me they've all got good modern thinking leaders, but of course two of them have got substantial chunks of state aid. How do yeah. you view those three? Do you think IAG is going to change post Willie under Lewis and Alex Cruz moving on from BA? I mean, uh, if I take them separately, look, I mean, I, I think IAG is by far and away the best place. Willie did a brilliant job in IAG over the last 10 years, you know, to such an extent, frankly, I'm delighted he's gone. Yeah. In the arts competing with him because I think he did such a great job. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge for IAG in the next uh, 12 months though will be Brexit. And you know, the ownership rules can you keep British Airways within a Spanish owned or EU owned airline group? And I think that's going to be a huge challenge. But other than that, IAG will certainly emerge stronger and with a lower cost base because you know they've gone through the pain of furloughs and job losses and efficiencies imposed on them. Uh, because they didn't have access to the same state aid that uh, Air France, KLM and Lufthansa have had access to. Um, in the case of Air France, and K Air France, KLM and Lufthansa, you know, I think Carsten and, um, uh, uh, sorry for the brain Thanks, freaks, uh, uh, Ben uh, mm -hmm. in Air France are very able, you know, in many ways, very able executives, by far and away the best that those airlines have had in the previous 20 or 30 years. Um, but I think that there's enormous challenge. The state aid uh, is really going to fetter their ability to lower the cost base. You know, it comes, the state aid has come with so many restrictions on pay cuts and you're know, getting rid of overstaffing and things like that, that I think they would be very challenged going forward for the next five or 10 years. The balance sheets would be very challenged. Now, there's a risk in that, and that is, you know, you, but they will also attract more government protectionism, and we will see more and more government protectionism. I mean, what the Dutch and the French are doing with Air France KLM, we can't get slots in Schiphol, you know, because the, the Dutch government are paranoid about protecting KLM from competition. Um, so you get a lot of that kind of protectionism going on, but ultimately, in the, in the short to medium term, I think that will be difficult for us to uh, challenge over the medium to longer term, you know, I think it will really pose huge, they will emerge out of this crisis with much greater and higher, more inflated cost bases than IAG, Ryanair, uh, EasyJet and others who have been forced because we don't have access to state aid to really suffer some considerable pain on the labor side on policies and with our airports. Um, so I would, and then God bless Alitalia, you know, an airline that's lost money every year for 75 years has gone bankrupt God knows how many times. And yet in the middle of the COVID crisis, the Italian government runs in and gives them three and a half billion with which they make no changes, uh, restructure nothing, and will emerge out of the crisis with only about two thirds of the fleet that they went into the crisis with, but with even higher labor costs and even more inflexible uh, labor practices. Uh, that Seems to be the, the, eternal, the eternal phoenix of the industry, I think, Michael. I mean, let's just look at the, 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 the LCCs. I mean, well, Norwegian yeah. arguably is not truly an LCC, and the news this week doesn't bode well for them. Do you see uh, Norwegian surviving? You gave a view last week in yeah. the results, but things have moved on again. Are they going to make it or, or stay the rump? I don't think so. I mean, like Norwegian wouldn't have survived the government in Norwegian government didn't bail them out. Like Norwegian would either finish up as a tiny Norwegian domestic airline or somehow it'd get merged into SAS in some, you know, Scandinavian, new Scandinavian model of um, loss-making inefficiency. Uh, and, you know, the three carriers that will emerge stronger out of this would clearly be Ryanair, the LCCs. EasyJet, you know, will clearly survive. Uh, you know, Johan has a good team there. I, the challenge for EasyJet is the that's balance sheet is... Yeah, but uh, I mean, that's the problem. The balance sheet is getting destroyed, you know, like they're under pressure from Stelios. Uh, to shrink the, the, the fleet, uh, which is not what you do coming out of a crisis when there's opportunities to order more aircraft cheaply. You expand faster. Um, but they're, you know, and they're doing a lot of sales and leasebacks at very distressed prices and, you know, at high costs. So I think they will in time emerge out of this with a higher cost base. But given that they will, I think, shrink the business back to those kind of core high-cost airports, Gatwick, Paris, Berlin, Switzerland, 
you know, they will still have a very retail or, or a, a strong niche as a higher cost, higher fare kind of mid level model. But as a competitor to Ryanair, I, I don't think they will be in the neighborhood. Um, Wills are clearly, you know, will come out, will emerge uh, reasonably well. Because they're set up uh, in Eastern Europe, they have a more flexible labor model. I think the challenge for Wills, though, coming out of this is, one, they're doing lots of these sale and leasebacks on their aircraft, and their aircraft costs are very high. The gap between them and Ryanair on aircraft costs are widening. And also, you see them moving into markets like Norway and Italy, where they're facing to, up into the union challenges that we had to address in 2017. Uh, and I think that's going to fetter their growth in Western Europe uh, and make it much more difficult for them to kind of, you know, continue with these kind of, you know, the tax avoidance practices of recent years where they hire people in Norway or in Hungary and pay them through a Swiss payroll. You know, that's not going to survive unionization, which is inevitable if they want to expand more in Western Europe. So, I, I still think, you know, they will emerge as the next best to Ryanair, but the gap between uh, Wiz and EasyJet's cost base and Ryanair's cost base will materially widen uh, as a result of COVID-19 and the way we have uh, managed our way through this crisis. Uh, you, you very much answered my, my questions uh, about Wiz, uh, Michael, because I was going to ask if you felt in any way they were like snapping your heels. I, I've sometimes thought of Wiz as maybe the Ryanair of Eastern Europe. They've now moved out of that territory, as you said, and they're doing a lot of testing in uh, Western European leisure markets. They've got the Abu Dhabi venture. I just saw, you probably saw yourself just for release this morning, Joseph Ferrari's just renewed his contract uh, as a C CEO. What about the, just on the, the aircraft side alone, I mean, they've got up to about 240 seats on some of those 321. So at least in terms of aircraft unit costs, feeding through the ticket prices, uh, that must be something you look at and reflect about given what we we're just discussing on the max and the, the benefits you gain from your own growth there and seat count. No, I don't really. I mean, if you look at for the last three years as they've been adding A321s, their aircraft unit costs have risen faster than their traffic growth. You know, the gap is widening. As we have added the uh, end of line NGs to our fleet, and certainly as we start adding the max 200s, our aircraft unit costs will fall and the gap between us and the likes of WIS will widen further. Um, but, you know, WIS is a well-run operation. Uh, it will certainly emerge as the third low-cost carrier in Europe. And I'm not sure over the medium term whether we'll describe EasyJet as a low-cost carrier in the future, but, you know, they are in that group at the moment. Uh, and I think, you know, there is... I think, if anything, COVID has accentuated the extent to which you're going to see the emergence of, you know, five major, four or five major carriers in Europe over the next 10 years, and that will be IEG, Air France, KLM, Lufthansa, and Ryanair. The challenge for the EasyJets and the Wizzes, certainly, is that, you know, Wizzes put itself forward as the, the low-cost carrier of, of East Central Eastern Europe. We're the bigger airline in Central Eastern Europe, and with a lower cost base than Wizz has. So the challenge for Wizz is as we move into their markets, as we have done in recent years in places like Romania and Bucharest and Ukraine, you know, they keep moving further east or down to Dubai to avoid this. I think that's good. Again, good management by Joe Varadi and the team is stay out of Ryanair's way because you can't compete with us. But they are a well-run airline and they will certainly emerge out of the COVID crisis as the next best in Europe behind Ryanair. But, you know, respectfully, a long way behind Ryanair, but probably with a, a better and lower cost base than EasyJet. What they won't have will be EasyJet slots at um, the, the primary airports. I think the one interesting case that we're looking at is Gatwick. Mm -hmm. And Wiz are clearly trying to get more slots in Gatwick. I think slots will free up in Gatwick. What's interesting is what will IAG do with their Gatwick slots? I was you going know, to say, this is interesting because, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, Joe was out saying, you know, the, the use it or, or lose it rule should not be extended into the winter. It has been now. Uh, no idea whether it's going to get extended a third season. And as you said, BA, yeah. ironically, they spent money to buy some of those slots of Gatwick in recent times with the Thomas Cook and the Monarch yeah. failures. Um, it seemed to me like he'd move in there. I, I guess that airport you could look to move into. and. Answer a bit more, uh, you know, sorry, interrupted you about Gatwick, but also what's your feeling about the, the lose it or uh, use it or lose it rule on slots? Um, do you think you go into more slot constrained airports? We wouldn't have imagined you, for example, being in an airport like Frankfurt till a couple of years ago. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I think firstly on the use it or lose it rule, 
Firstly, it shouldn't be extended, but it will be. And it will be because the French and the Germans and the Dutch want it extended, so Europe will do what the German, Germans, French and Dutch wanted to do. Uh, I think it will be extended into summer of 21. Uh, I don't think it should be. Uh, and we have opposed that, but I think it still will be. And the, the risk for that with the airports and tour operators and national governments is the more you extend that rule, particularly in the summer of 21, there'd be no incentive for the Lufthansa's and the Air France and the KLM to put capacity back into the marketplace. They will happily constrain capacity because they can block the slots and allow fares, you know, they'll be charging very high fares on the limited number of flights they operate. Um, but I think... Gatwick specifically, you think... Uh, yeah, oh, Gatwick specifically, yeah, look, I, think, I view, what's interesting is I think it will seize an opportunity to go in and undercut EasyJet and Gatwick. Uh, and I think, like, frankly, God be good to them. Norwegian slots, I think, will become available in Gatwick. I would be surprised if IAG gives up its slots in Gatwick. Mm. I've always held the view that I think they'll reallocate those Gatwick slots to somebody like a Vueling or maybe an Aer Lingus or, you know, one of the lower cost models within the IAG family, subject, obviously, to Brexit. But I would be very surprised if they were to give up those slots to someone like Wiz or to EasyJet. Uh, but I think Wiz will certainly grab a lot of the Norwegian slots and they'll get them as a new entrant there because uh, I don't see Norwegian re-emerging in Gatwick. I think what's interesting in that is we have very little, I mean, I have no interest in Gatwick. Um, most of my focus is on Stansted. Uh, I uh, see huge opportunities for us in Stansted. EasyJet are closing the bases in Stansted and Southend. I think we would certainly look to uh, take up their slots we would like to expand in Stansted and to a lesser extent in Southend. I do fly to Gatwick. I would certainly add more flights back into Gatwick, but frankly, historically, Gatwick has been an expensive airport with expensive handling. Um, whereas at Stansted, we have a very low cost operation. We have a long term growth deal in place with MAG. Uh, and I think, I think there's opportunities there for us to extend those deals at Stansted because the big CapEx plans have been, you know, can now be postponed. Uh, you know, and the great joy in London is, you know, I think they uh, did the third runway in Heathrow has probably disappeared for another 50 years, as has the second runway in Gatwick. Um, and there will be opportunities, but I would like to see, I, mean, I think it would be interesting to see Wiz square up to EasyJet in Gatwick. I think partly that's Wiz recognising that they can undercut EasyJet in Gatwick, but that they can't undercut Ryanair in Stansted. Uh, but we would certainly be very focused and I think very keen to return to growth very quickly in Stansted as soon as there's a vaccine and a reasonable recovery. I think Stansted would still be my airport of choice for London because of the efficiency of the facility. And you have a good management team there in MAG who we work closely with, not just in Stansted, but also in Manchester. Some of which are former Ryanair guys, of course, so uh, we know you very well. Yeah, I know, but we forgive them, you know, those... I don't know why they ever left, just... but nevertheless, they all want to go to the richer, easier pastures of running airports. A lot easier <laughs> to run an airport than it is an airline. And Michael, I mean, you know, the, the origins of a lot of our success on airports was in you know, a smaller secondary airports, you know, some small, some some large, or some that you have made large, you know, like Charleroi, like uh, Bergamo. But you're in most primary airports now. Do you worry about uh, airports' futures? I mean, I've, I've sat around the negotiating table, as you know, with many of your team and got a few more grey hairs in consequence on behalf of airport clients. But the secondary airports have been an important part of your network, especially many of the small ones. ACI talked about maybe up to 200 airports in Europe could go bust because, of course, the small ones are lost making even before this crisis. What's your feeling about the airport side of the tracks, not the, the, the ones with uh, regulated charges and a, a much more certain future, but the small ones? So is there a new dynamic there to be had where Ryanair could actually be of help for these airlines to keep going as opposed to them being squeezed into the ground? Yeah. Look, I think the future is still, you know, I never believe anything ACI say. You know, you can always tell ACI when they're lying. It's usually when every time their lips are moving. So any forecast or prediction that comes out of ACI, just ignore it. You know, the regional secondary airports are not going to go bust. They will be bailed out by their regions because they are such huge kind of, uh, employers and uh, economic levers for the regions. And, you know, they while they may lose money through the COVID crisis, it's a fraction of... Uh, the kind of money uh, that they that the, the main airports are I, uh, losing. And the, the challenge in airports going forward is going to be twofold. One, can you stop the regulated monopoly lunatics like Heathrow, Gatwick, and Dublin going back into their regulators and say, "Oh, we lost money because of COVID. Now, please pass that on to airline customers and consumers in 
higher regulated charge the next couple of years. And the bananas world of airport regulation probably allows them to claim back all their COVID losses from the same airlines and the same consumers who have suffered more than airports have. And you saw Heathrow, you know, the most egregious monopoly ever invented, have already been into the CAA looking to recover their COVID losses from the same customers who aren't even able to fly. Uh, and so, you know, that regulatory model is utter rubbish. Um, but you have incompetent regulators being gained by very smart and bright airport managements who are absolutely convinced that because they have a monopoly, they have this divine right to recover all their costs, no matter what happens, and they don't actually have to deal with reality at all. Uh, and that is doomed to fail. Um, I think the other challenge for us, though, and I think this is where there's a real opportunity at government level, what do I want governments to do is, you know, to roll back on these ridiculous bloody taxes if you really want to get tourism moving and the industry moving again in Europe, you need to get the British government to, you know, waiver or, you know, withdraw APD for the next three, five years. You need to get, I, you know, AIDA, or AINA, the Spanish monopoly, you know, lower your airport charges for the next two or three years. Uh, the, again, airports are uh, ADR in, in Italy, airport to Paris in ADP in, in France, you know, we can't, if we're going to recover this industry and we need to recover this industry, quickly to get young people back into work. Stop, you know, the German government giving 10 billion to Love France is a complete waste of time. Giving 10 billion to Air France is a feel? complete I waste mean, of time. I, I want to lower ask a couple more. taxes and lower environmental taxes to everybody, and then we pass it on to consumers, and that's what gets people back moving again. I want to try to squeeze a couple more questions in, Michael, but just, just a, a quick uh, supplement to what you said. I mean, do you feel any hope? I mean, the industry at large, certainly I know here in the UK, is saying at least wave APD for a year or two. Are there any politicians you speak to you think are hearing that just like they do? But what is it? Eat out to help out on restaurants? Do you think they might see the light on aviation? I mean, I hope so. Like, I mean, aviation is devastated. Tourism, I mean, we're at world travel market. Tourism is devastated. You know, it, the governments have a choice. Do you want to recover this industry quickly and get young people back to work? Or do you want to recover it slowly so that, you know, the legacy airlines can make money uh, charging 600 euro return airfares again? You know, I think it's a slam dunk of a question and it's an easy answer. I would be reasonably optimistic. I mean, I think there's a reasonable prospect of getting persuading the Spanish and the French and the Italians uh, to reduce the taxes, reduce the, the ETS taxes, but really lower airport costs. I mean, the Spanish government owns AENA, you know, they, and then most European governments own these airports, uh, apart from the Greeks and uh, some of these others where it's owned by the German airport monopolies. But generally speaking, that's the best way forward. Mm -hmm. You know, I was asked at the weekend, uh, do I just to, want more? Just want to cut you short. Sorry, I'm, I know it's uh, important. I'm just okay. trying to get two more in. I've, I've got so many, but I'm not going to get to uh, ask you. Just in terms, somebody asked a question from your audience. You know, if you were starting yeah, yeah. an airline from scratch today, what would you do? And I'd like to blend that in a strange way. The question I had, you had an interest, you said a personal interest in the past to, to do your own version of long or low cost. Uh, so what would you say? How would you build an airline from scratch? Uh, and do you still have an interest or do you think that model is now uh, done for given what we've seen I and mean, indeed the failure of long or low cost to make money even before the pandemic? Yeah, hey, two questions. I mean, if I was going to start an airline from scratch today, I wouldn't. Because certainly in Europe, I don't think you could, and I may say this with great humility, I don't think you could actually do a better job than Ryanair does. The entry point, you know, the price the, 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 the price point for entry in Europe is now gone because Ryanair is in every market at 9.99 lead-in fares. And, you know, uh, so I'm not sure it's possible to replicate what Ryanair has done. Uh, in, it certainly isn't in Europe. As long as we don't screw it up and we stay loyal to the low-cost ethos, I think we will be unchallenged in Europe in the next... 10, 20 years, and Europe will need us to get the continent moving again. Long haul, low cost, I, you know, I talked to, we looked at a couple of us. Fundamentally, I've never been a believer in long haul, low cost. And the problem for that is on long haul, it is a different business. Yeah. There will always be 15, 20% of the population will pay ridiculous premiums, 8, 10, 20 times the cost of uh, production for business, first class, business class. And therefore, I think it is, you know, stripping it down to 25 minute turnarounds or to, you know, uh, basic, uh, the basic add on philosophy is never going to work on long haul because long haul will always be about the premium cap. Uh, so I don't think long haul low cost works. 
Norwegian, well, I mean, you could argue Norwegian was long haul. It was never really low cost, but it hasn't worked. Even the AirAsia X's of this world don't work. Like ultimately, long haul is a different business. Short haul is commoditized. As long as it's safe and it's punctual and it's on time, you know, it works. Uh, the lowest cost will win. Whereas long haul is a different model and therefore I don't think long haul low cost works. Uh, but you know, what we all have to be wary of is Star Trek. Somebody eventually out there somewhere is going to find a way of beaming us around beaming the house and then we're all screwed. Michael, just, just uh, wrapping up a bit, I uh, just wanted to ask you a, a question. I, I've asked it before. I think Tim Clark, I put this to a few months ago. I mean, we're in this crisis. This is an industry that many people want to join. I saw on a webinar the other day, a pilot uh, trainee with, with you actually saying, yeah, I would encourage people to still join the industry. Airlines like Ryanair are going to recover and grow. Yeah. What would your advice be to young people who perhaps don't see the chance right now to get in? What should they be very optimistic? Um, you know, look, I have to be very optimistic. You know, there are lots of jobs going to be created in Ryanair. The long haul or the low cost carrier like Ryanair will, I mean, I think we will grow to 200 million passengers in the next five years from, what, 150 million now. Uh, we will have new aircraft. We will create more jobs. But, you know, uh, we will also subcontract. I think the jobs in the future in this industry are going to be pilots, cabin crew, and computer software people. You know, there's going to be no very few jobs for anybody else. Um, apart from the uh, a couple of accountants, but basically, I would I still think there's a very bright future in this industry for pilots, for cabin crew, uh, and also for the uh, the computer people, the Ryanair Labs team, which continues to grow and deliver enormous. I mean, you've really evolved in that way, haven't you? You've really embraced digital massively in recent years. Uh, we have, you know, because originally it was always going to be the front end. Remember, the whole digital front end was the way in which, you know, we released ourselves from paying travel agents and GDS is 20% of our revenues. You're never going to hear from a GDS or a travel agent ever again. As long as we can stop Google getting in the middle of our uh, relationship with the passenger, if we can keep Google out of it. Uh, and then I think, you know, we will always be a uh, front end uh, and that will continue. But what we've done in labs in the last couple of years, John, particularly during the COVID crisis, we're writing all of our own backup software. So, you know, we're replacing all these expensive Lufthansa systems and all these ridiculous old expensive systems that run our rostering, our flight operators, everything else. And that's going to significantly reduce our cost base going forward and give us much better rosters, much better flight operations, much better communications directly with our customers. I mean, now when we have delays, we're able to send emails, text SMSs, we have a much more open line means of communicating with customers. And I think that leads to a very exciting future. And last question, Michael, as the clock is truly uh, uh, catching up with us now. What's next for you? I mean, I mean you've been in the helm a, a long time and uh, you, you're not doing it for the money, I'm sure. Um, what's next for you? Can you envisage a, a Ryanair post Michael O'Leary and a life post Ryanair for you? I would hope so. I mean, because I think the test of any good business, you know, is, is the management evolution and development. It can't be... In much the same way, Southwest, you know, moved beyond her. Ryanair and the Ryanair Group of Airlines will move beyond me in the next four or five years. Like we've now, the group structure enables us to train more people to be CEOs. We have CEOs now in uh, Buzz in Poland, Mihail K, K I can't never pronounce his second name, David O'Brien in Lauda, where Andreas Gruber in Lauda, Jimmy de Canila in Malta Air, and Eddie Wilson here in uh, Ryanair Jack, all doing a very good job, all getting their teeth into it. So, Again, it's one of the things I learned from Willie with the IAG model is it's a great way to create more management at the senior levels, move people around, give them more exposure to different areas. Uh, I'm signed up, I think, until 2024 or whatever else it is. Seems to me, I, you know, I would be, uh, that seems to me to be a logical way uh, to replace myself over that period of time with one of the other people within either the company at the moment or bringing in some outside. And I would hope, you know, if it gets to 200 million passengers by 2024, Hopefully, it's making two or three billion a year in profits. Uh, the share price will have risen, and I'll be on a Caribbean beach somewhere, probably blind and hobbled and crippled at that stage. But you know, and I'll be Alzheimer's will have taken over at that point in time. I'm going to say, just spend the year with Mrs. O'Leary and the kids down in the Algarve. Probably something you're trying to avoid your best to do. No, no, and thankfully, Mr. O'Leary and the children like going to the Algarve without me. Uh, and I am one of the great joys of the Algarve. It's a great place for people to go and visit. We have a large base in Faro. Uh, I love the Portuguese people, they're terrific. Uh, and, you know, there's great facilities down there for golf, tennis, water sports, everything else. So it keeps my children occupied. 
and frankly keeps me away from my children, which is what they prefer, and I think ultimately what I what I prefer. Great, Michael. I could talk to you for I don't know how much longer, another hour, so at least plenty more to ask you. It's been great to talk to you now this last hour. I think very enlightening for the audience who I hope learn a bit more about Ryanair than they perhaps knew already than the normal sound about. So Michael Leary, CEO of Ryanair, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks to you for sticking with us. Tomorrow we'll be back for another session with uh, Robin Hayes, CEO of JetBlue. And that's it. Over and out for me. Michael, again, thanks a lot. Thanks, John. And can I just say to everybody at the WTI, you know, this is time, I think, to be positive. It is a time to look forward. We did get great news on the vaccine yesterday. It's going to be the first of a number of vaccines that will be signed off before Christmas. And I think as an industry, you know, it's the first real sign of guys, a bit of sunshine we've had for the last 12 months. I would look forward into Easter 21 and summer 21 with a fair degree of positivity. And I hope, you know, uh, we get the Max back flying before the end of November. And then we and Boeing will uh, begin to uh, resume growth into summer 21 and summer 22. And we'll all go back to doing what we do best, which is giving people great travel experiences, bringing people all over Europe. And keeping, I think, uh, particularly the tourism industry going and getting young people in Europe back to work. Great. Michael, thanks very much. Keep well, keep safe, keep flying. Thanks very much. Keep flying, Ryanair. God bless. <laughs>